like to welcome everyone tonight to Central Baptist Church in Woodbridge, Virginia. I'm Pastor Brad Winnegar. This is a great day. It's an exciting day. It's the first Sunday of 2022, a brand new year for Jesus Christ. We had a great, great time in the Word this morning, and many folks are, are still considering all of the, uh, all that's involved in the notebooks that we talked about this morning as we read through the Word of God, and uh, we should be uh, through a number of chapters already since this is the second day of January. Remember, now every weekday, that is Monday through Saturday, we read two chapters in the Old Testament, take a few notes and, uh, and complete it, and uh, then one chapter in the New Testament, take a few notes, complete it, have a word of prayer, do so prayerfully, ask God to open your heart, reveal things to you. Then on Sundays, we do a little extra. We do three chapters in the Old. I hope that you did today or will before you pillow your head tonight, and two chapters in the New Testament. So that puts us up to speed. I hope by next Sunday, everybody's up to speed. Had somebody call this morning, uh, text this morning after the morning service and say, save me one of those notebooks. Now, they're just ordinary notebooks. They become special when you personalize them, when you get into the Word of God until the Word of God gets into you. So that's our desire. How many of you would like to, by the grace of God, read through the Bible at least one time during this year? Raise your hand. Come on. Amen. And all of you out there, I'd like to welcome our folks that are coming uh, by uh, live stream. God bless you. It's good, to, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn your attention with me to Isaiah. Once again, Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26 and verse number 4 tells us what we need to do. It says, Trust ye in the Lord forever. Now we read in Sunday school, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's the New Testament word, faith, and the Old Testament word is trust. So here it says, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. I want you to keep that in mind tonight, and then also turn with me to Psalm 91. What a wonderful psalm. There it begins, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. There you have it, the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. These are Names and titles for God. Now, verse number two, please note it. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. Notice the personal uh, pronouns, the descriptive terminology here personalizes. We have a relationship that's personal with Almighty God. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him Will I trust? There's that word trust again. It is the Old Testament word for our New Testament word, faith. Well, praise the Lord. Tonight we're gathering together. We want to sing one of the great old songs. I want you to think about the songwriter in this case. I like to give you hymn histories. And I don't know if it benefits you at all, but it, it thrills me to read about these men and women of old that wrote these gospel songs and these hymns and their life and their testimony comes out in the words and the music of these old-time songs. We haven't gotten rid of the hymnal yet, amen, not planning to. Haven't gotten rid of, uh, of uh, four-part music. Haven't gotten rid of the old-time way. Going to keep the old-time way as long as we're breathing, amen, Till Jesus calls us home. But there's a, there was a special meeting. You know how it is when we have special meetings. Revival meetings, evangelistic meetings. And, of course, everybody has high expectations. Usually there are cottage prayer meetings in preparation, people praying for, for months in advance, people fasting and praying, as I have encouraged you already. I have these cards for each day of the year. I want to give these out again uh, this week and next week and until they're all gone. There's going to be a great revival meeting up at Winona Lake in Indiana in June of this year. We are praying and fasting for revival. We're believing God. So there's preparation being made six months out for a great revival meeting. Uh, hundreds of Baptist churches, Bible-believing, King James, Bible-believing, independent Baptist churches participating. 
Think about that. Going to have a great revival. Praise the Lord. When you do, you're looking for the stirring, the moving of the Holy Spirit. You're looking for God's people to get right, to get on fire for God's souls, to get saved as a result of that. Well, there was one of those old-time meetings back in the old days. And they had, they had all the preparations. They did all the praying. They did all the fasting, all the preparing. And they had the meeting. And when the meeting was done, they had one decision. One decision. You say, whoa, that's a disappointment. Well, the fellow that got saved is named Augustus Toplady. And Augustus Toplady went on to write, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in the... I'd say the meeting was worthwhile. Amen. Amen. Take that burning hymn book out tonight, if you will, please, and turn to 185. And would you please stand with me as we sing together, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Amen. 185. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy rim side which flowed be our sin. Stand for prayer tonight, will please. Amen. He is that rock. We know who he is. We know him personally. We have all the personal pronouns. He's our Savior. He's our shepherd. He's our rock. Father, we thank you now for the word of God, the truth of what's going to be brought tonight from the Bible, which is inspired and preserved. Bless us now. Encourage us that this year we may live for you, we pray. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Turn around and say hello to someone. Say Happy New Year or how are you doing or uh, some greeting and then please be seated. Well, Amen. Amen and Amen. We have, uh, of course, a very busy week, a number of things scheduled every day. We have devotions and Wednesday night we have our Bible study in the book of Colossians. Don't miss it. It's 7.30. And then uh, this Saturday we have a, a cleaning day. But uh, we also want to remember Wednesday we have a funeral and that's at 11 for viewing and 12 uh, down at uh, Mount Castle. So I hope that you'll be there and uh, be a blessing to the Harps family. And then on Saturday, I neglected to mention this morning, but we'll get out the word we have a Bible Institute session, 1604, this Saturday, January the 8th at 3 p.m. And we are continuing in the life of Jacob and the applications of his life, the lessons learned. And uh, this is a good study. I hope that you will uh, make it a point, not miss it, and tune in online and recruit others as well. We're in a subscription campaign. Now is the time to talk to folks about such an important thing. Amen. Get them to become part of this. All right, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide 
myself in thee. How true that is. I'm bringing a message on not all, but some of the names of God. So whereas I'm preaching on the names of God tonight, I'm not preaching on all the names of God. It would take, it would take well, it would take a week. I'll re- just recall for you for just a moment, review that in our former ministry, we had a day camp uh, for uh, family members, adults and, and everyone. And uh, at that day camp one year, I brought a series of messages on the names of God. And uh, of course, in the course of doing that, I preached on the holiness of God's name. And there came a time, I, I, I believe it was a Wednesday, because some of my, some of my Timothys, uh, now they're much older, but they were young then, and they were students in the Bible Institute out there. And they still remember, they say, Preacher, they say to me whenever we talk, do you remember when you brought the message on that day, that Wednesday, or whatever it was, on the holiness of God's name? I said, I do, because I didn't expect it. I was just teaching, I was just preaching, but it was under the power of the Holy Spirit, and it was like a thunderclap hit that place, and people were struck with the holiness of the name of God. People will use different initials when they're texting, and they'll put OMG. I don't care how you cut it, that's swearing. I've heard little kids, it just breaks my heart because they've been around other little kids. But they're all the time saying, forgive me for saying it, but they'll say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. After I preached that message in our last ministry, people were watching what they were saying and not taking God's name in vain by using His name flippantly as an exclamation. The names of God. This new year, let's get it right. There's so many things we need to get right. We need to read our Bibles through. That's why we did what we did with the notebook today. And a lot of folks, <laughs> they, they don't understand what we're doing. Oh, man, do I have to go back to school? No, it's just something so you can jot down and go back. And I can read. And my wife said, why don't you photocopy your notes just to begin with and show people what you do. Well, I just put 1 1 22, Genesis 1 and 2, and just wrote down some phrases, some things that struck me. In the beginning, God. Everything's got to be God in the beginning. Amen. And God said, let. And God said, let. And God said, let. See, everything, the starting point is when God says. Not when I say. Not when somebody else says. Not when my emotions say when God says let. That's when it happens. That's when things begin. That's when things start. You like those thoughts? Those are the the kind of thoughts that the Spirit of God lays on your heart when you're reading through the Scripture. The phrase, after His kind, after His kind, after His kind, after His kind. Do you know what we do? We produce after our kind. Good, bad, or indifferent, we produce after our kind. We do. We have to take responsibility for what we produce. And then God looked. He saw It was good. It was very good. If God took a look right now, what would he say? I know what he'd say. Not so good. Not so good. Sin has tainted the creation. So that's just, you know, just an idea, just taking a stab at it. I'll I'll have some more to add, and I may make copies. I don't know. We'll see how that is. But it's a wonderful thing to get into the Word of God. I want you to do that. And... uh, And just, I mean, just start out. Develop a good habit. Get in the Word of God. Don't just read willy-nilly, you know, kind of any old place, any old time, but have a system. Read through the Bible. Jot down the thoughts that the Spirit of God gives you and go back to it. Go back to it. And you'll you'll find yourself sitting on a bench somewhere sometime or, or in a place, a public place, and be talking about the things of God because you've taken the time to read it, to think it, to write it, to review it, to go back. And you know what? That's the way our brains work. We will, we will grasp only a small portion of that which we go over one time. 
And if you go over it with no connection elsewhere, I'm not saying that the Word of God won't do you good, but it won't do you as much good as if you apply some of these principles. Always pray, trust God, always approach it in faith and reverence and get away from the distractions and do it every day. About 15 minutes a day, you can get through the whole Bible in a year. Wow, think about that. All right, all right. So let's start out right. The way we begin with God to understand what's going on in the Word of God and in our application of the Word of God is to realize that He is Almighty God and we are not. He decides. He directs. We're supposed to follow. We are bought with a price. We belong to Him. We need to acknowledge Him. He is Lord, but it doesn't do any good unless we acknowledge Him as Lord. He is Lord, but it's no good unless we surrender to His Lordship. It's going to be a very painful, bumpy ride unless we say, you're God and I'm not. You lead. I'll follow. Amen. Amen. The scripture that we read tonight as we began is Psalm 91 and verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. That's the same as faith. There it is. There it is. Psalm 91, 2. The underlying Hebrew word for Lord here is Elohim. Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. I will say of the Lord, Elohim, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, Elohim. In Him will I trust. This is important for us because as we think about the various names and titles of God, how important is it for us to understand in context which title, which name is being used? Elohim, of course, is the first of the names that appears in Scripture for God. In the beginning, God. Elohim. Elohim. It expresses the general idea of greatness and glory. Let's wrap our minds around that. Let's be practical about this. God is great beyond our comprehension. He is glorious beyond our ability to rejoice and extol His glory. This name, Elohim, is plural in number. It is masculine in gender. It is the name of God appearing exclusively the first 35 times that we have God from Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 2-4. Although the noun is plural, it is accompanied by verbs, adjectives, and so forth in the singular. How can that be? You say, that, that doesn't go along with English. Well, folks, it wasn't written in English originally. It was written in something other than English. And it comes across in the Hebrew as being plural noun, Elohim, God, with singular verbs and singular adjectives. This indicates the trinity or the triunity of God. Our God is one essence but three persons in one. Because He is three persons in one, as the Bible says, we know that He can relate to us. God the Father, God is spirit, and they that worship Him worship Him in spirit and in truth. And it's not that He's impersonal, but He relates to us by the second person of the Trinity, same essence, same God, different person, God the Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he comes down, he's born of a virgin, he's sinless, he's in a body for 33 homesick years away from glory. He takes our place, he experiences all of our pain and sorrows, all of our difficulties. He understands. Wow. The plural gives us a sense of God's majesty and greatness. Sometimes I'm guilty of, of using the plural pronoun we. 
when talking about something that I do, think, feel, or whatever. And my sweet wife reminds me that it's supposed to be I, not we, because I'm the one that wrote it. I'm the one that thought it. I'm the one that said it. And I say we. And that's just kind of a, a thing that preachers do. Sometimes politicians do that. People speak in a kind of a collective pronoun. But truly, we can't do it like God does it. When God is we, when God is plural, it's because He is. I'm not. I'm not. In 1 John 5, 7, which truly belongs in the Textus Receptus. We have the Trinity, the triunity of God. And throughout the Bible, we see examples of the Trinity, the triunity of God. We see at the baptism of Jesus Christ by John the Baptist, we have God the Son in the water, Jesus Christ. We have the voice of God the Father, this is my beloved Son uh, in whom I am well pleased. And we have the dove descending, that's the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity on several occasions, and we have the Trinity appearing in several different passages of Scripture. We need to have a proper perspective of the greatness of God. I know it's impossible for us to totally and completely understand that, but Elohim, the name of God, the first name of God that is used, is, is that way to help us to understand to the degree that we can, to accept to the degree we can the triunity of God. I want you to know tonight that our great almighty God is a personal God. He's not just distant. He is a personal God. He knows all about you. He cares for you and for me. And because of that, He desires that we know about Him what is necessary for us to properly worship Him, obey Him, and follow Him. Are you listening to me? If people are going about to follow a God that they have created in their own imagination and it, that God doesn't line up with Scripture, then that is a form of intellectual idolatry rather than obedience to the Word of God and to the God of the Word. We need to know who God is. I have a desire to know Him. I'll never forget back in the 1960s, we had a friend from Canada, Davy, And Davy came rushing in one day. He was so excited. He had somehow tuned in and he heard George Harrison singing My Sweet Lord, which of course you know now because of all lawsuits was kind of a plagiarizing of another, uh, uh, you know, kind of a doo-wop song. But... Uh, he had written, My Sweet Lord. And Davy was confused because Davy came in and said, I think he's found the Lord. And I listened to the ending, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. And I said, nah, different Lord. Different Lord. Because George Harrison had been, like many, influenced by Hinduism. And so multiple millions of gods and not like we think of, uh, and of course, the whole concept of Hinduism is to keep going round and round and round and round in reincarnation and trying to escape all of this and achieve nirvana. What a horrible, hopeless existence. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. There is no coming back. There is none of that. None of that. In the course of singing that horrific song. I didn't say terrific, I said horrific song. George Harrison says, it's so hard to know you. It's so hard to know you, Lord. Because those that are believing in Hare Krishna, in Krishna, are, are having to go through multiple lives, they think, in order to get closer and nearer and nearer and nearer and nearer and finally psh, out to nirvana, nothingness. Horrible, horrible. All you have to do is get into the Word of God until the Word of God gets into you. You'll know the Lord. You'll get to know Him. You'll understand who He is. He is who He says He is in the Bible. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless His holy name forever. So often when we learn the names, the designations of God Almighty, the holy names of God, we're beginning to understand how He works with us, how He interacts with mankind, and how we can best Obey and please Him. We have all of the Jehovah combinations. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sabaoth, Jehovah uh, Macadescom, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Sidkenu. That's an interesting one. From Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, I have some old messages by the, the old preachers, John Wesley and, and uh, Jonathan Edwards, but... But George Whitfield, the, the, the outdoor preacher who preached to crowds of tens of thousands without microphones and amplification, would preach with such pathos. It was said that if he pronounced the word Mesopotamia, he'd make a man weep. That's how dramatic he was and how much pathos with which he preached. He would preach in the open fields. He was rejected by the organized church of his day. He was, he was a Methodist uh, of, of a different stripe, but he was, he was in the same movement as the Wesleys. But as he would preach, even Benjamin Franklin, himself not a believer in personal deity, stood there and was moved. He said, I was so moved by his preaching, I was ready to empty my pockets into the offering plate as it was passed. Now, that, he was saying that with tongue in cheek, but that's, that's Benjamin Franklin who didn't believe in the Jesus Christ that Whitfield preached, but he preached with such pathos. And he was begging in this message that I was reading. He was begging folks, weeping with copious tears, begging people to receive Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah our righteousness, that without him we would not have righteousness. The only way we would have righteousness would be by propitiation. It would be by the application of his righteousness on an earthly level. And that's true. The name Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Shema, Jehovah Rapha. We have all of these different names. They're, they're hyphenated combination names of the covenant name Jehovah, which nobody ever pronounced. We have evidence that there was, there was a period of centuries in which it was forbidden by the Hebrews, by their culture, by their law and their practice to even pronounce Jehovah. We don't know how it was pronounced. Just the tetragrammaton the four letters, and that's why some people say Yahweh or Yahweh or whatever. They don't know. And it was later on that the vowel points were added. But the vowel points were added for another name, Adonai. Adonai is the name of the great sovereign governing God, the one who rules, the one who is Lord, the equivalent of New Testament Lord, Adonai. So they would take the tetragrammatron, the four letters for Yahweh, and they would put the vowel points above the Hebrew letters. Now, it's the opposite of the way we read. And they would put the vowel points from Adonai or from another name so that when the reader would read, they would not say anything close to Jehovah or Yahweh. They would, they would say Adonai. They would say Lord. They'd say the boss, the one that's in charge, Adonai. And they wouldn't mention the covenant name. What a shame. But they held in such high esteem the name of the Lord. They would not, they would not pronounce it verbally, orally. Elohim, Elohim, the same name, the, 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 the God, the plural God with the singular verbs and adjectives, the one that is so magnificent we can't even wrap our mind around is the one that I preached on last week from Psalm 19. We have the works of the Lord, the creative works that, that testify 
of him, then the word of the Lord, then the workers of the Lord in whom he does this work of grace. We have at the beginning of Elohim the letters E-L. And throughout the Middle East in those times, even pagan gods were known as El. It's the rest of it that makes the difference. So we have Elohim, plural, magnificent, a God, the only one of his kind, the Almighty One, the one who creates everything. And then we have El Elyon, and we have El Roy, and we have El Shaddai, and El Olam. All of these with the letters E-L on the front. And each one tells us about who this God is and what he means for us in 2022. Let's take El Elyon for just a moment. El Elyon means the Most High God, who's the highest. Together, they leave no question as to who's in first, <laughs> who's ahead. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. He's the, the one that's high. There's no question. Nobody else is in the league. Nobody else is even considered. We would say that he's the strongest strong one. There is no there is no chance that he is ever going to let you and me down. He is the champion. He is undefeated. He's the champion of love. He is the champion of grace. He is the champion of hope. He is the champion of peace. In every designation, he wins the gold medal. He comes out in first place. He sets a record that no one will ever approach. He's unapproachable in the sense that no one else can do what he does because no one is who he is. El Elyon. Satan tried to usurp El Elyon, but he was unsuccessful. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven in Isaiah 14. El Elyon is in charge of everything, heaven and earth, all property, all people, for all time, throughout eternity. El Elyon. He is our champion. In Psalm 78, verse 35, very sad passage of Scripture. We read about some failures on the part of God's people. But then they would recall God. They would come back to their moorings. We need to come back to El Elyon. We need to stop diminishing our thinking concerning God. God is the great greatest. He is the most wonderful wonderful. He is the highest high. He is the biggest, the greatest. Nobody approaches him. In Psalm 78, 35, and they remembered that God, Elohim, was their rock, and the high God, El Elyon, their redeemer. So we know that he is one and the same. Elohim and El Elyon in the same verse in Psalm 78, verse 35. He's also known as El Roy, R-O-I, El Roy. That means the strong one who sees. You remember when Hagar had lost all hope out there in the wilderness, Seeing just her, her life flash before her eyes. She had no hope. She was in despair. She was in the wilderness. And God, who is El Roy, the one who sees, spoke to her. Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? The Lord knows our situation and he completely understands. He knows all about it. Just as in Hagar's case, who seemed so lost and so hopeless and apart from God, there was, there was no hope apart from what God would do, and God showed up. God in His attributes shows up, in His love and in His mercy and in His ever-presence, in His, His being there for us. He shows up. God who is rich in mercy, the Scripture declares in Ephesians chapter 2. Like a father pitieth his children. Notice the personal, once again, pronoun. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Psalm 103 and verse 13. Again, that prefix El shows up with El Shaddai. And we know this is the name of God that reflects on the warmth and the comfort of a nursing mother. And all we need is that relationship. Forty-eight times in the Old Testament, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. When Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. El Shaddai, 
El Shaddai. You remember in the days when you were growing up, when you were hurt, maybe you would fall and stumble or hurt yourself and you'd run to mom and she'd nurse you back. She'd, she'd put something on it or she'd hug you and she'd, she'd press away your tears and she'd say, let's go get, let's go get some cookies and milk. And it seems like the best medicine was mom's medicine. Amen? And the best medicine is God's medicine for all the hurts. When you fall and you bruise yourself and you hurt yourself, who's going to come to your rescue? Who's going to run to you? El Shaddai. El Shaddai will come and bring you back to health and make you feel comfortable again. When we've gotten out of fellowship and out of range, who's the one that draws us back with arms of love? El Shaddai. All of these different facets of God himself make the realization more, more vivid that God has everything we need. He does everything that we need done for us. He, he knows everything that is necessary. Not only El Roy and El Shaddai and Elohim, but El Olam, El Olam. The name of God means the everlasting God, not limited by time or by our weakness. The part, the olam part, means disappearing into the midst. And so if eternity is pictured as a past with no beginning and a future with no end, and there's nothing there but a mist, kind of like this morning when I got up and there was nothing but fog and mist out here. Coming down to church, you could hardly see the front of the car coming down and that's what it was that's that's the same picture there is there is no wrapping our mind around eternal past or eternal future but God is El Olam disappearing into the midst as far as our comprehension is concerned we don't have the capacity to understand the eternal God but he takes care of everything for all time he takes care of everyone he nurses us back he brings us back uh, to comfort. He understands us when all hope is gone and is lost. Uh, he is the highest. He is the most powerful. He is the strongest. He is the one who takes care of us and looks after us. He's the everlasting God. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 says this, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, El Olam, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Think about it. Tomorrow, the next day, the next hour, the next moment. When you're feeling hopeless, full of despair, grief, worry, absolutely, absolutely convinced that there is no way out. There is, there is a way up. And his name is El Olam. When you're praying, this week over an impossible situation. Pray to El Olam. I'm talking about Almighty God who is everlasting. Eternal past, eternal future. Look at me. Look at me. You that are watching this broadcast, God's got this covered. God's got it under control. He is so great, there is no contest. The world, the flesh, and the devil will come against you and me again and again and again and again. And because we are flesh and because we are weak, we feel like we're going to stumble, like we're going to crumble, like we're going to be crushed, like it's all over. And it's at that moment that we turn to El Olam, almighty, everlasting God. He's got this. He'll renew our strength. We'll be lifted up on His strength, on wings, and we'll be able to run and not be weary spiritually and walk 
and not faint. Think about it. All the opposition that this world can throw at you and me does not even, doesn't even get out of the starting blocks in this contest against God. It, I mean, you talk about a team playing another team in a bowl and one team not showing up. You know what I'm talking about? I had a couple of those, right? It's the same thing with God. The enemy will talk big to you and to me because we are five cents kind of people. And with five senses, we hear it and we get discouraged and we get downhearted and we're feeling blue and we're feeling difficult and it's just not, if we don't do this, there's just no hope and we're not going to make it. We need to stop right there and say, Lord, you got this. El Olam, you've got this. I believe you. I trust you. And on those wings, I'm going to fly. And on those legs, I'm going to run. I believe you. That's my God. He's got us covered. The same everlasting God who, according to Isaiah 40, 22, sits on the sphere, the circle of the earth, that same God can bless our life with strength if we'll wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. Instead of running ahead and coming up with what? Our five cents answers? Our logical answers? Hey, folks, guess what doesn't work in this contest? Our five cents answers. No, here's the one that works. All right, world, flesh, devil, you're coming against me. You're trying to defeat me. You're trying to crush me. You're trying to beat me. You're trying to put me through despair. All right, here you go. Here's, who, here's who's going to be competing with you. El Olam. El Elyon. Elohim. El Roy. El Shaddai. Why don't you try him out? Try him out for size, world, flesh, and devil. No contest. No contest whatsoever. In that same chapter in Isaiah 40, all nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold and casteth silver chains. That's it. All they can come up with is their phony gods, behind whom are the limited powers of Satan and his demons. Nothing, nothing compared to God. Now, I can't stand up to the devil and demons without him. Thank God I've got him. And my champion steps up and says, okay, Lucifer, let's go. It's all over. It's all over. It's all over. If, perchance, you as a believer have inadvertently invited that demonic visitor into the living room of your life and emotions and your thinking. And he won't leave now. He's an intruder and he won't leave because you don't have power to kick him out. Pick it up. I'm talking about the Word of God. I'm talking about prayer. Dial 911. I'm talking about getting in touch with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and ask him to come over and to remove him. Satan, you have no right World system, you have no right. You have no jurisdiction. Flesh, you have no jurisdiction. I know that we're going to be contending with this until we're called home. But in the meantime, when we are faced with a challenge, instead of trying to do this with our five senses, let's call the champion. Let's call the one who can remove the enemy. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head bowed. You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. 
through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask him to save you? Something like this, dear God, just pray, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to his word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.